to take the time and learn all the things that I could about you. Now it's such a mess here. Oh, we are distressed here. Used to be so easy with you. Yosemite Valley. Yosemite gives its own masterclass in composition and color. We let you experience something that is impossible to really capture when you visit. You get to see Yosemite in the ideal way, which is to fly like you're Superman around Yosemite. The story and the magic of the whole thing is being in the environment. The things that you're going to experience are things that you can experience in a lifetime. So you get to see the entire park and all of its features, and then you get to drill down into one little special magical spot and be there. At Yosemite, it is the valley that makes its mark on us. Thank you so much for coming on my show today. Thank you for having me. Okay, this is really big, this whole VR theater experience in Yosemite. When did you create that, this? Like, you knew you were going to start this. So, before COVID, my business partner, Keith Walker, was talking to his friend who makes the chairs, the Positron chairs. And they had this idea of, maybe we'll try it someday. And then during the pandemic, when everything's locked down, we had to figure out, when we survive as a theater, are we going to survive, um, survive? Or are we going to come out stronger than when we went in? And so one of the ideas we had was let's put in a virtual reality theater with a feature Yosemite experience created for that theater with Brian Cranston. We didn't know it was going to be him at the time. Wow. Right? And let's put it all together, all these city lights making the movie, Positron making the chairs, us having the space, put it all together and create this thing. And the thing released on July 11th, finally. So it's you were getting the experience of Yosemite when you... So, yeah, so what happens is you sit down in one of the pods that look, you know, right. from the back they look like alien eggs or something. It's yes, creepy. Definitely. From the front they look like captain chairs, you know. So you get into this pod, you put on your goggles, you adjust it, put on your headset, and then it's, the chair slowly tilts back and you hear Brian Cranston start talking to you <laughs> in this soothing, like, voice, and you start to experience Yosemite. You fly through the valley, you learn about the... Uh, how John Muir was talking with Teddy Roosevelt. You see historical things. You see the history of the Native American baskets. You find out all these things. You zoom up on El Capitan and watch how Alex like made his way up there as you're like floating up El Capitan, looking off all the way down to the ground. Wow. So you do all these things. And then when you go visit Yosemite after that, it means more to you. Or when you visit Yosemite and come back, and do this, then your experience means more to you. So it's an in addition to, not a replacement. I love that. No, that is so great. So you came up with this, you did this. I would think, because you always go there with the personal questions, this would be very expensive, isn't it? Because just those chairs alone. So how do you guys, I, pandemic, is invest in all, this is a big chance. And yeah. the location, um, so how did that all come about? So it was lots of people trusting us. Um, that's how it always has been, though. There's people up in the mountains that believe in our innovation. So they backed us when we went to digital projectors, when we put in new seats, when we did our whole renovation connecting the two sides of the theater, when we just took over the place next to us and tore out the wall to make space for this. Like, they always partner with us and trust us. And then City Lights, who made the Yosemite experience and got Brian Cranston to do it, they invested their own money in that. And then together, we all partnered together with a way to make the money back for everybody. And that's kind of, that is the future now. Um, but we, we put in a lot of, there's a lot of skin in the game. I imagine Each there Each chair weighs 300 pounds <laughs> and is a computer in itself and like basically a vehicle. And it, they're not cheap. And because of that, they're also amazing. They have scents, they have smells. You smell the pine trees. They can make no you- No way. They can make you feel like you're floating, like you're flying. What? Yeah. Sense? I don't think I've ever heard yeah. of that in a VR experience. Yeah. That must be like the first on that one too. That's so yeah. amazing. It's kind of like you, how you feel when you're doing Soaring Over California, like at California Adventures at Disney. Wow. Like you, you smell the oranges there. Well, this oh is, you see the campfire going and John Muir talking to Teddy Roosevelt and sparks are going up in the air and you're like, 
I smell a pine forest. I smell a campfire. Oh my goodness. So. And um, can you eat and drink in those? It is a computer. I'm really worried about Klutzy Sparkle drinking a soda uh, and like. Me too. I'm worried about myself. <laughs> I, I'd be like, I smell. Oh no, right? And then there we go. Um, right. no, so what happens is we have cubbies. And so it's kind of like if you were going to get on a roller coaster, you go set yourself in your cubby and then you get on. Um, so we do allow, you know, if ladies have small purses, they can keep them with them or something really valuable like that. They don't want to put their Louis Vuitton in the cubby. It's okay. They can set it off to the side. But any food or drinks or things like that, they we can We can't set. have it in there, yeah. How um, long is each experience? Do we just get to choose? So, okay, if I go and I sign up, I pay for one experience. Right. And then how long is that? So the Yosemite experience is 17 minutes. Okay. And it's a nice 17 minutes. Like when it gets done, you feel satisfied. You don't feel like you're in there too long. People that aren't used to virtual reality, if you keep them in, you know, over 20 minutes, over 22 That's minutes. That's smart, okay. Sometimes, they'll, the, you know, they're not used to this. It can get overwhelming. Right. 17 is perfect. Um, the Everest experience that we have right now and the animation called Asteroids Invasion, which is these little aliens in a bunny, it's super cute. It won an award at Sundance. Um, I love those that. two are about 12 minutes long. So, and those feel great too. So, sometimes we'll combine two little ones like Invasion Asteroids, a four minute and an eight minute together to tell a story and creates a 12 minute. And then Everest is a 12 minute. So, they can be anywhere like that, all the way up to we have one right now that's 40 minutes long. It's a narrative, post apocalyptic, like you're in the story, kind of movie ish. It's an animated one called The Great Sea. So, we haven't promoted that one yet because that's in the future, but it's there. So is this created just for your theater? The Yosemite experience is just for our theater. The other things you can kind of get if you have a, a VR headset at home? Yeah, but the big, well, some of them. But the big difference is the reason that, as a filmmaker, the reason that uh, VR, I feel, has lagged far behind other things in narrative filmmaking is because a director can't get you to look where they need you to look. You know, if they're making a movie, they can blur out the background over there and be like, oh, there's Sparkle. And everybody's like, oh, we should look at her because everything else is blurred out. Right. Um, and they're looking that way. Well, in VR, what if something's happening behind them? Right. And they <laughs> like, it. Now the story's all broken, right? And also people get seasick with VR because if they're sitting in a chair and something's happening all around them and their body's not moving, then they feel ill. So something with the Positron chairs and the reason it's exciting as a director is because now a director can tell the audience where to look. So as we want you to look at El Capitan, the chair is pivoting and your VR is syncing with it to look at El Capitan. Now you can look off and see all the way down. You can look behind you and see the pine trees or the waterfalls, but that's where you should be looking, El Capitan, wow. and you can see it. And so the director can go, hey, this is where we're looking now. And then as this text comes out to tell you something, the chair has turned you that way, so you know to focus there. So it allows you to go on a story experience as opposed to sitting at home with your VR goggles being like, Wow. Totally so you get, you're getting nudged. Actually, yeah. the chair is nudging you. It's like a VIP experience versus like, I don't know. I always think of a mall VR chair where it's like, duh, 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 it's like it shakes you all around and you're like, you hear like the motor servos are like, and you're like, what is even happening? <laughs> like in a really bad simulator of a roller coaster. That's not what this is like. This is, you feel like you sat down in just like the super comfy, crazy chair and then silently fall into this experience and magically go to another place. So um, you have showings of this? Yeah. So everybody in that room is going to see the same thing at the same time? They don't need to. We can show individual chairs can right. show any individual content at any time. So if there were 16 people, because we have 16 chairs, and they all sat down in the 16 chairs, we could hit a button and then everybody, you know, at the same exact time, it looks really cool. The whole entire room's like a ballet. How fun. It's like, it's oh like my gosh. It's like wedding. You know, it's like everybody just <laughs> is in sync. Um, but we could also say, oh, that half wants to watch Experience Yosemite. That half wants to watch Everest. They can do that. Or, you know, I brought little, little Caden wants to come see this, but he doesn't want to watch Everest, so let's have him watch Invasion Asteroids on that chair while Mom watches Everest over here. So we can do things like that, too. So has it been set up? So what's the deal now if we want to go and watch it? Is it open to where we can go yeah. watch it whenever? Open to the public. Um, all of our times and everything is at our website at YosemiteCinema.com. So people can go there, they can scroll down to like what's showing now and they can see the VR content. So every day? Every day. And then it will, and they can look in the future too. They can pick dates and be like, oh, what's this in five days? And so then they can oh, either awesome. get tickets there or they can get it when they show up. And right now, I think that as long as they show up, it happens every 17 minutes or 20 minutes. So, so it's like as long as they show wait, up and yeah. they're like, oh no, 16 people are there. The odds are they'll be able to do the next time, you know? Yeah, you're not yeah. waiting forever. That's really cool. Yeah. 
And so tourists are just finding out about it. The fire, the Washburn fire, had made a lot of them displaced as they wanted to go into Yosemite. So they had traveled all this way, spent all this money, gone up to the park, and they can't see anything. You know, they go to tunnel view expecting this magical view, and they see smoke. And so they were, they were sad and disappointed. And so they'd come down, and they'd do the Yosemite experience. I love that. And it's not a photoreal experience. So we're not flying drones through Yosemite. It's illegal. It's what we've done is create a virtual exact replica of Yosemite, and we're able to exist wow. in that. So that's why it's in addition to. Nothing can beat seeing tunnel view or standing by El Capitan and looking up and being like, I am so small, you know? But this is the thing that you should always add to it. It's what I wish the Grand Canyon had. I just went there and saw that they had a room that said the Grand Canyon experience. And I was like, wow, it's gonna be so exciting. I wanted to do it. I wanted to learn more about the Grand Canyon. I wanna fly through the valley, you know, all that stuff. And it was locked. And I asked, well, what's going on? And they're like, oh yeah, we don't have any chairs in there. And I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, we just have bolts sticking out of the ground. These are the rangers. And I'm like, why though? And they're like, we don't know. <laughs> I'm like, well, that is unfortunate. So <laughs> here, that we, we are that attraction for people going to Yosemite through the South Gate. So that's what we are excited about. Oh, wow. So um, are people hitting you up because they want to do this in their towns as well? Like you just said, the Grand Canyon. Is that something you see the future going towards? I do think so. Now, that the, now it's combined with Positron Chairs. I think that it's going to spread out because now people can tell stories, like I said. And I think that until now, as a director, I never wanted to tell anything in VR because you can't control it. People, you don't know if they'll even get the story you're wanting them to know. You know, it's like something goes, da-da, and they're like, oh, what happened? I missed it. So now that this happened, I think you can have a Grand Canyon experience because you can fly through it. You know, you can point them to the, the layers and all the time periods and all that, that that created that canyon. You know, you can do all that stuff. And so I think that will be there. I think Yellowstone would be a fun place for it to be. Um, learning the historical things, seeing sites you might not be able to see. For instance, Ansel Adams in the Yosemite experience, he got the monolith, which was his picture of Half Dome, that made his career, started everything, right? And, and created people going, what in the world is this beautiful place? He, he had one chance to get it. Like, people don't understand, he was one filter and one click, one exposure away from never getting it. And that would have changed everything. And so wow. you get to hear the story of how that happened as you're standing exactly where he is, as you're looking through his camera, oh my. things like that. That is so exciting. Wow. And that, I love how you combine with all these different people to make this happen. Because, I mean, that must have been a big leap of faith to be like, how are these chairs going to work and work uh -huh. with that? And how is this gonna, production going to look? And, you know, who are they going to get to be a narrator? I mean, other people were in talks before this because Brian Cranston was busy. And so there are big names out there. And we're like, well, they say that somebody's going to do it. It's a big name. And we know that they're putting their money in, and we're putting our money in over here, and we're trusting each other. It's all going to come together. We hadn't seen it, you know, as they're building it. We just knew, I mean, that Greg Downing is the cinematographer, and he did I Am Legend. He did a bunch of things where he did the photogrammetry creation of visual worlds like this for those things. So we knew amazing people were behind it, but there was so much trust. So when we sat down in the chair, programmed for the show that we hadn't seen, with the narration of Brian Cranston that we hadn't heard. And we sat there for the first time. We're like, well, with our room that we've now built, we're like, I, I hope it's good. And wow. when it got done, we like felt really emotional. We're like, it is. We're like, oh, it's amazing. Everybody came through. And so now it's like, it just exists and it always will. So everybody coming to Yosemite is gonna get to do this. And it's now like a thing. I feel like we moved a mountain in the midst of a pandemic and like now, people get to enjoy that, and we get to enjoy them enjoying it, which oh is exciting. Oh my, that's incredible. And so is it, you're gonna have to kind of keep content going because locals, they're gonna be like, we've yeah. seen all this, so how is that a challenge you're gonna tackle? So Positron actually has tons of content. They used to go to Sundance and Cannes and all these places like that, and they would get award-winning VR content, and then they'd program their chairs for it. And so they'd get the rights to it. Um, how to Train Your Dragon, um, something wow. called dragons, like un exploring into space, first man, um, all these things, Mission Impossible, a thing with Mission Impossible with Tom Cruise on his zero gravity airplane, a thing called wing walkers where there's a lady that thinks she's in her 60s and she does wing walking on biplanes and has a virtual reality camera on her so you get to experience what that's like. So they have all these neat things. 
So we'll pick content like movies, and they'll come in every two to three weeks. But Experience Yosemite will stay, and then probably two other pieces will rotate, and then that gives people fresh content. That's awesome. Wow, you have thought of everything. Hopefully. We don't know. <laughs> we'll find out. I'm sure there's stuff we have not, but we'll, we'll discover it, and we'll, we'll fix it as, it as it comes. So is that the next challenge? You're going to film a VR movie? I thought about it. I, I, I've thought about it. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> and how's the other one do? I love Girl on the Mountain, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. It's doing great. Um, it's, it's r ratings are going up. We're at about four out of five stars now on almost all platforms. And it keeps ticking up. So hopefully 4.1 soon, 4.2. It has, right now it has an 85% positive audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, which is exciting to us because we wanted to make a movie that mattered to people, that like impacted them emotionally. So it feels nice that that's happening. So where can our viewers watch it? So everybody can watch it at Amazon Prime, Vudu, Google, Apple TV, um, anywhere you can rent or buy movies, it will be there. And they just search for The Girl on the Mountain. And then I will always tell them, as a big ending, it is a drama about overcoming pain and grief in your life with thriller elements. It is not a thriller with drama elements, so that's something important to know. Um, it's, it, it's emotional. It matters. And it's also exciting. Um, but it has a big ending, and after the credits, there is an Easter egg. There is something that happens. So, yeah. so how was that writing that for you? Was that an emotional experience, yeah. taking that piece? So um, a year ago, I lost my godson in a hit-and-run accident. Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry. And it, it was very painful, and we've been trying to figure out justice for all that. Um, but before that, I had dealt with a year where I think I lost three to four people in my life through death. And right. so I was studying kind of grief and how do you go through grief and how, how do you process it as a human. And what I came to realize for myself is that grief is a wilderness. I don't think there's, a, there's not a, just a way through it. It's more like once you're in the wilderness, you just got to keep moving. They say in Frozen too, it's my favorite thing, it's, if you don't know what to do, you just do the next right thing. You know, and that's so true. Like, sometimes you don't know what to do. And so I wanted to make a movie. Um, Chris Mejia is my business partner, and we work together to try to tell a story that shows people kind of how to move through grief and how somebody did move through grief, two different people, and how their lives collide, so, and how that heals them. Uh, and unlikely people. Unlikely would, people. Yeah. yeah, that was great. <laughs> and so that is, um, and my... My godson went through the same thing as one of the characters does in the movie on the same road that we filmed on. No way. Um, wow. A year after we filmed it. So it's dedicated to his memory. So that is. So wait, you wrote that before knowing that that was going to happen? Yep. So we filmed the movie and then on the road where we filmed, he was hit by a car and my daughter plays the little girl in the movie, right, that is healing with the man on the mountain. I live in the mountains, and my daughter is one of the people that helped me heal. So it's just very interesting to me the way it all worked out afterwards. Like, the movie helped me heal through what came later, and I didn't know it was going to happen. Because so. you're right about the other three people that had passed before then, not mm -hmm. your godson. Yeah. Wow, that is so crazy. I yeah. love that. that. What a great story. Yeah. So is the next one you're going to work on a little more cheerful? I don't know. I, um, I don't so, think you want to be that hesitant. That, no. that was probably a lot. You're probably so, yeah, it was a lot. <laughs> I, right now I'm in the, the creative mode. So we're working on a couple ideas. We're working on a Western. We're working on a Christmas movie. We're working on a musical. That's exciting. Wow, <laughs> I love that you're really going out of the park of like what thriller. anyone does. And let's see. What else? And I'm writing the sequel to my novel, my first novel. So those are the five things that we're working on right now. Oh, I, I feel, Tom, what's your novel about? I don't think we've ever talked about this. I'm sorry, Matt. So my first novel was Stormbreaker. It's a fantasy, modern fantasy. Okay, you're such an overachiever. I can't keep up with everything you do. <laughs> Forgive me. Well, that's what I did in college <laughs> instead of listen. I wrote my novel in okay. class. So. Um, so, yeah, I released it on Amazon. I'm trying to remember when. A long, long time ago. And then I got it on Audible. Um, Probably about five years after that. Okay. But so this has been on for a while. Yeah. So, okay. I, I wrote a long time ago. <laughs> Before Sparrows. I yeah, I a long time ago. Okay, I got it. Um, and then, yeah, modern fantasy, you know, big good versus big evil. People 
fighting monsters on like skyscrapers of New York City, um, but in fantasy, like Lord of the Rings meets the Matrix. That's so, so cool. So yeah. are you ever gonna make that come to life? Uh, not yet, because I would need a lot more money. And so it's gonna be a sequel to that. Yeah. It's going to be what happens next. And you left it open for a sequel. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. This is so cool. I got to go look at that. Yeah. <laughs> You'll have to listen to it. The, the reader does an amazing job on Audible, too. Oh, wow. So, but, yeah, so we're just I'm creating, and I'm not shooting anything right now. I'm learning how to fly first-person drones to add my drone work. I'm trying to, like, better myself and improve myself, hang out with my family, do the VR, and then regather all of that energy that, I just ground me into the ground during the finalizing and finishing of The Girl in the Mountain. Yeah. Well, nobody thinks you're an underachiever <laughs> for one <laughs> second. I'm glad that you said you're taking some time. Yeah. Wow, this is so impressive. Thank you so much for coming on my show yeah. today. This is so great. And I have to come out and get the experience. Yeah, you need to come up and do it and film yourself getting in there, putting the headsets on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then it feels, it feels like you get swept away into this thing. It's my favorite experience. I love Everest also, because when am I ever going to climb Mount Everest? I, I'm not. That, that, hey, that might, knowing you, that might be your I'll next write a adventure. Book about it, but, I'm not, <laughs> but I mean, watching people pick up the side of that and you're right there with them because you're on a journey of a guy who tried to hike it for the first time without any supplemental oxygen. And it's, it's crazy. You're in the tent with them during a snowstorm, listening to them talk. And you, it's, but Yosemite experience is my favorite. And I will add this for my movie, for The Girl on the Mountain. It is the first time that we've found this much success with the film. I've made films since 2010, feature films, and I've been proud of them. Um, but this is one of the first ones that resonated with me on like a very deep level, and so I really wanted it to do well. And we ended up having a bidding war for it. Three decent indie distributors wanted it, one won the bidding war, and we were able to pay back all of our investors. Nice. the profit. And they, they promised that, like, that they believed in it. And they got it out there. The trailer's been seen, I think it's 1.2 million times. And the... Wow. Yeah, and the ratings are pouring in. People are loving it. They're messaging us. They're commenting. And that's what mattered to me. Like, you know, if it doesn't make another dime for us, it's... Like, people are being affected by it, and people that are grieving are being affected by it. And they're feeling hope in their life, which is what we did, wanted to do when we wrote it, you know, and what we wanted to do when we shot it. So all the hard work came out to be worth it. Um, and it makes me inspired to do more, but it also is pretty daunting, because you're like, oh, now I want another project that I care that much about. And you might not find, it might just be, it might be it's gonna be a different one, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Killing Kate, what's going on with that? Killing Kate is still, basically it's like fishing lure. There it is, feature script ready to go. Okay. Um, with it, uh, but somebody would have to take it on and invest in it for it to be made. And oh, it's I hope so, because it's such a great, um, I love that one. I, I hope you. it gets yeah. that. The script is fun. And if we want to rent out the VR experience, you know, someone's yeah. having a bachelor party or whatever, it, we can. Yeah, you just, they just, Contact me. Because that'd be a great party, I'm thinking, yeah. like to have all your click friends on do that. The support at Yosemite Cinema it goes straight to our PR lady named Ann Driscoll. She's awesome. And she can work that out. We do that with theaters too. Right on. Thank you so much for coming on my You're show. Welcome. Thank you so much. Tell me why you're out here, all by yourself. Somebody's gotta be looking for you. Nobody. Well, I can't just leave you here. Who's coming? Who's Big Al? <laughs> Is your daddy looking for you? Is that why you're up here? What happened? We were both gonna learn to respect me. You can't run from me. I'll find you! That can come back on all of us. We'll find her. Gear up. So here's the deal. If we're gonna stand a chance, I'm gonna need to use this. 
go. He dies tonight. I know you're scared, but I made a promise that I intend to keep. This little game is over. Who are you? Remember, we are brave. Thank you so much for coming on my show today. Great, great to be here, thank you. Okay, so tell us a little bit about you, your background, what you do, and the event on Saturday. Sure, well my name's Fred Vanderhoof, I'm chairman of the Fresno County Republican Party. I'm a retired school teacher, and uh, so I've been chairman for a number of years here. But this is, this is so important that we get people to run for office, especially school boards and city councils. And uh, there's something called parent, parentrevolt.com and uh, so if you want to check that out or anybody else. Anyway, parentrevolt.com is trying to get people all over the state, conservatives, to run for uh, school boards especially. And we see all that's happening with our schools and the curriculum. And being a school teacher, you know, I, I'm really concerned about that too. So we're having a, a, um, we're having a seminar, a workshop on Saturday, next Saturday, uh, the 30th, 9 to 1. Uh, FresnoGOP.org is where people can go to sign up. But we're going we're gonna to train them. We're going to teach them. We have some people that have that are been in all. Frank Gonzalez, he's the former mayor of uh, Sanger, uh, running again for mayor. And we have some other, a mayor of Kalinga and some others. And then we have um, some other people coming up from LA and that are going to train people. You know, don't be afraid. You got to step out and do it. School board and city councils are, are easier to, to run for because you don't have to have as much money as you do, obviously, for a higher office. Why do you think people are apprehensive to run? I don't know. They see, they see the news and, and maybe they feel like it's going to be difficult, but it, we need people to step up. And uh, this is a crucial time for the history of our country, this next election. And uh, we need people to, to not be afraid but to step up and I think that's probably maybe fear of uh, uh, being on the camera or something and, and being in the news or something or like that. Or maybe fear of losing. Yeah, that could be too. <laughs> but we'd rather have people run and lose and than not run at all. So, But chances are they will win because you've got people from all backgrounds. You've got independents and Democrats, Republicans, who are all uh, up in arms about all this uh, crazy curriculum that's coming down. So. You know, I think that there's a very good chance that a conservative can win in this environment with all that's going on with what they're teaching our kids. So it's a good time to run. So I have a, um, a mayor coming on in the next few weeks, sort of a smaller town, like one of the ones you mentioned. And he's been on and off for about 20 years of his town. And he's like, you know, he wants to throw in the towel this year to be his last year because he said that he would like to get some newer blood in the office. He thinks right. that, that it would 
that someone newer or younger can make some of those changes. Is right. that what do you guys feel about that? Is that some of the goal here too? Is to get some sure. newer people to make some changes? Can you know, people first go in, they're all yeah. excited, they're like, let's do this oh, and this definitely. before you get twenty years in and you're like, eh, and you're right. not trying new things anymore. Yeah. Is that part of the goal as well? Oh it is. I mean we, we need people we need to pass the baton to people that are younger. We I just came from our, our headquarters. We had a a young guy from San Joaquin Memorial, one of our interns, he's 15 years old, he wants to run. I said, well, a little bit, little bit young, but you know what? I think 18 might be the, the, the age limit there. So, you know, uh, we, we definitely need younger people uh, to, to run. And so that's one of the goals too. And not all of these speakers are, are old guys like me, but uh, some of them are younger. So, yeah, we, we need to pass the baton to the younger guys. And then how, um, I know that's like the um, Republican Party, but there's a lot of people that I think are apprehensive because um, I know it's a new day, so some people like have tattoos or certain things and they're like, oh, I don't think I would get elected because of maybe this holding me back or that holding sure. me back. You know, you know the culture oh, we live right. in and then people put the pictures of them partying on Instagram like years ago and they think it right. might come back to haunt them. Are those valid concerns for the political, like the Republican Party or not really? You know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago it was, but I, not really now. I, it's, we need good people. You know, we've all made mistakes in the past. And, and obviously the other side will probably try to bring something up. But, you know, go for it still. We, we need people to go for it. And um, I don't think those things are kind of as important now with inflation, with the gas prices, with uh, international problems, with the border problems, and, and, and then, again, the curriculum. So. I don't think those things are, are quite as important as they used to be. So the Republican Party has kind of turned around a little bit and sure. we're like, okay, let's, right. let's yeah. all work together well, for they, the issues and not. Right. People still, some people still think the Republican Party is, is uh, rich, rich old white man. Stuffy. It, right, stuffy I, I've heard right. it all. <laughs> yeah, you know, right. But you know what? We're, we're, we are getting more Latinos. This is across the country. Right. We're getting more Latinos that are uh, voting Republican, voting conservative across the country. Uh, down in um, Texas just last week, I think it was, the young lady down there who won. So, you know, this is not, this is not just a party. We're, we're, our, our culture is under attack, and we need anybody and, and any kind of background to, to step up and we'll help them. And it's, it's so important because now is the time. August 12th is the deadline. So what's that, a couple, couple weeks away or so. And there's, so come to our, our event and uh, we'll give you some training, some good ideas, and, and go for it. So you think you could school people in such a short amount of time to get ready for the election in a few months? Oh, well, yeah, it, it's not, there's not that, it's not as much to, to, to learn when you're running for a school board. Okay. Uh, well, I mean run, for running for office. Once you run for office and you make it, then, you know, there's uh, things you have to. So the, the run's not as, as daunting as people might no, be right, thinking it. No, it isn't. I mean, some of these, I've, I've known people that run for city council, Fresno City Council, and they, uh, they wore out, you know, two pairs of shoes because they, they just walked, uh, they walked and talked and knocked. To everybody. Doors. Yeah, everybody. And it doesn't require, especially, again, uh, city council, well, of a small town, and school boards, it doesn't take that much money. And uh, we just need people to, to, to understand that if they don't stand up, there might not be anybody. Or you might have somebody that's on the school board that, you know, well, what are they doing on the school board with what they believe in? Well, you know, did you, did you run? That's what we're going to say. Did, did, did you run? Did you make so, the, did, did you, you make make do that? Right. So one of the things I've noticed, and you know, I've had many politicians, local politicians here, is that I just, people are not going out to vote like they need to be voting. That's, and right. I've always said, I think local politics are where it's at. They're more important right. than national politics yeah. for us, especially in a town like Fresno. Right. Um, so how can we be effective as a community and viewers watching? How do we get people to go out and vote? Right. Well, the, 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 <laughs> there's something going on across the country right now. And it's, it's a new way to get out the vote. GOTV means get out the vote. And you're right. A lot of people are frustrated and, and they've kind of given up and uh, they're, they're concerned about all the news, but you know what, we can't give up, there's still time. And uh, so we've, uh, the most important thing we can do is to, to knock on the doors of our neighbors and talk to them face to face. You know, we, we'll make phone calls, we have to do that. We'll, we'll distribute literature, we have to do that. But knocking on the door of your neighbor is, is where it's at. And so that's what we're trying to do um, all around this county is find people to do that. And, 
again, they can go to FresnoGOP.org and sign, sign up uh, to, uh, to volunteer, and, and we'll, we'll train them. It's, it's like Neighborhood Watch. Only it's, right. it's, it's a, a it's, bigger scale right. of a neighborhood watch. That well, makes it's sense. the same. Yeah, it's the same. You're, you'd be going to your. It's a bigger neighborhood. Right. It's a little bigger neighborhood. It's a precinct, so it's a little bit bigger. But you're going to your neighbors, and you know I've I've done it before, and I said, you know I, I live two streets over, I'm I'm your neighbor, I really want you to 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 vote in the primary. We it's public information. We have how they voted, or if they didn't vote. And so we say, you know, you, you, you didn't vote the last time in the primary. Can you please vote this time? Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, that puts the pressure on. <laughs> it does. But uh, you know, almost everybody says yes. And uh, now if they really do it or not, uh, we don't know. But we, have, but we can go back, see that it's also public information down at uh, county elections. You can find out uh, who has turned in ballots or not. And so every day you can find out who's turned in ballots. So let's say it's November, the election's November 7th, let's say it's November 1st. You know, the, the field is, is, is down a, a lot, so then there's fewer people to go to. And they're the ones that, you know, hey, you said you'd vote, and just, I just want to remind you. It doesn't have to be, no one's going to get angry, because uh, you're dealing with other conservatives. And, but this, that little urge, that little push to get them to vote can make all the difference. They've been doing it in Arizona for, for years. It doubles the turnout. Just this one simple thing doubles the turnout. Wow. So. And like, what do we do um, in these positions? Because I think sometimes people are like, oh, well, it's already, it's a California thing. We, and I've heard that many a times. People are like, you know, you, your Republican vote doesn't even matter because you have all these other towns that are gonna take the cake. And then people also think that for like school board, they're like, well, the curriculum's already there. There's not much of a difference that like right. we can make. How can you right. dispute that theory? Right. Well, we need we need people to run for city council, and school board, and of course, it takes a majority to get something passed. So it it might take depending on what school we have. By the way, we have 32 school districts in Fresno County. 32. Wow. I don't know how many kids that is, but that's got to be <laughs> tens of thousands. Wow. And, and we have, but we have 15 cities. Uh, Fresno and Clovis being the largest, but we from Kalinga to. Kingsburg and Fowler. So we, we can put a stop on some things being taught mm -hmm. in our school, yes. even if California is all on board right. for it, even that we yeah. can make a small right. difference. And, but I would say, even if you're outnumbered and you're conservative on a school board that has more uh, liberals, you know, you've got the, the, the people behind you. You've got the families, the moms, the, the dads. And you that's know? the thing I always hear parents, so, are, I always yeah. feel like when you have these discussions and you get to those heart to heart conversations and you're at a party, an event, everybody's on board with the same thing and then you're like, right. okay, we all think the same thing, why is this happening? Right. So right. so I would say, yeah, if, if, <laughs> if you're outvoted because there's more liberals on the school board, hang in there, stay, stay the course, you'll get so, so much support from, from the, the, the moms and the dads and the grandmas and grandpas. And uh, the next time you run, then we'll try to get someone else to, you know, to, to be on to help you. So it's, it's incremental, but it can be, it can be done. So where is the, the big division lie? It, it, it's really that divided between um, Democrats and Republicans as far as curriculum goes? It, it is. And you know what, when and I say- And not spend, spending, it's actual curricul curriculum is where we're divided. Is that, yeah, that the, the big divide? What is taught. What's in taught. Right, right. And there's a- I have to qualify the, the Democrat. I would say it's the leaders. The, the leaders of the Democrat Party are, are left. They're far left. And they're, they're behind this curriculum. But so what's, what's the, part the, of the curriculum that you're talking about? The sex ed, which is... is okay. Yeah. And then the um, CRT, critical race theory. Okay. And, and um, there's just, it's woven into you know, so many different like, social science and math. To where things yeah. are getting taught, history is getting taught a little bit different, right. almost to where it's not exactly. even like... Okay. Even math. Wow. Even math, you know, because there's word problems, and they want to, they can, they can, they can put in CRT, critical race theory, and math just problems. Just to put just it in, in there, right. it doesn't even have just to make a point. Okay, right. I get right. it. Right. So um, yeah, it's uh, um, it, it's really important to, to stand up and, and to stop this. So we're seeing a flood of people coming out of the public schools, going into private schools and charter schools and so forth, home schools. But you know, most of our kids. 80% at least, maybe 85, depending on where you are, are still in the public school. Right. So we, even if you, uh, you, you, you believe in maybe a private school, that's fine, but we've got to protect the kids that are in there right now in the public schools.
And then maybe people could send some of their kids back to public school. I know a lot of women actually left their jobs to teach their right. kids, and not because of COVID. It was because of right. all of this stuff that they were like, "I'm not. Right. We're not going to just let all this stuff every year something right. changes and our kids get taught whatever." So they actually had done that to right. teach their kids. So maybe if we yeah. can get things back on track. Right. Yeah. Exactly. We need to. And and uh, it's so, but, but this is the time. It's right now. Um, so we, we need people to step up, and we've got, you know, Fresno, Central California, San Joaquin Valley, it's conservative. And, and we are being attacked. We, the left is coming in, and they're focusing on Bakersfield and Modesto, and Fresno's right in the middle, and all these other towns. We know that, and, and they've, got, they've got more money. But we have the passion. We have, again, the, the parents and the grandparents, and even if you're not a parent or grandparent, you know, just have common sense. We've got people with common sense from all different races, all different backgrounds, all different parties that will, that will vote for uh, uh, people that are, uh, have common sense. And what are we looking for in leaders? I mean, I know you said you could have heart and passion and run, but what are some things that you, you think is needed, like when you're looking for somebody to run? Yeah, well, uh, one is that just to be able to, to read uh, a school board. You know, they have, you might get a, a packet, you know, that thick, or so, um, same thing with city council. And you just have to read that and, and uh, understand uh, what it says, what, what the, what, what the, uh, how to vote on it, and then you can talk about it with your colleagues or you can talk about it with uh, other people that aren't on the school board that are conservative. So that's basically, I mean, you, you, you have to be able to spend some time, but it's not a lot of time. And you have people that are pretty available, are really committed right. and, and put in the time to go to every meeting that's, right. that's needed, right? Right, go to every meeting. And, uh, you know, the school board meetings all over the country now have a lot of uh, parents attending. So, again, you're, you're going to get support from the parents. But, you know, that's just a little preparation, but it's not, it's not overwhelming. And everybody that's on the school board or uh, not city council, but school boards, they, they either get a little bit of pay or not much, but they're, what they're doing is so important. I totally agree. So that's really good. And I think people are watching are going to be more open to coming out and seeing, at least being open to coming and seeing and meeting with people and saying, what are, right. what are some of our focus? Because right. it's pretty much open to the public in that way. Right. So if someone doesn't want to run, but like, you know, has some ideas, right. maybe, you know, their neighbor is a good, a good candidate, right. they can come and listen to what you guys are looking for. Right, yeah. It's this uh, 9 o'clock and uh, we, if people sign up, then, they, then we'll give out the, you know, the, uh, the location. But it's 9 o'clock this Saturday, July 30th, 9 to 1. And exactly, we, it, people don't have to run, but if they're just thinking about it, they, they're welcome to come, fresnogop.org, and they can sign up real simple, then they'll... Fresnogop.org, guys. Everyone needs right. to go to that website. Right. <laughs> That's right. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be a good time. It's going to be some, they're going to have, some, we have some excellent speakers. And, oh, I uh, bet. I so mean, yeah. One of the speakers is uh, Sean Steele. His wife is a congresswoman in Los Angeles, Michelle Steele. And she's been in Congress now for, I think, uh, three, three, four years. But he's, uh, he's gone home and he's all, you know, uh, he wants to get school boards all over the state to, to have people run. So that's why I said, yes, sir, when he called me. I said, you know, we're, we'll, put on, we'll put on this event because we all believe the same thing. And right. So we'll, We'll see what happens. I wonder if some of the other people in your panel that um, that is telling you there's a, there's a couple other people that are also with right. you. There's uh, Nathan Vosberg. He's a former mayor of Kalinga. Okay. Frank Gonzalez. Um, he's a former mayor of uh, Sanger and going to run again. Um, we're going to have um, Fernando Banuelos, uh, school board parlier, uh, was, and then we've got uh, two others. I can't remember their names right offhand. Uh, Ron Nearing is driving up from San Diego, um, and, and he travels the world. He, he works for uh, another organization. He travels literally around the world to other countries, uh, encouraging people to run for office. So he'll, he'll be uh, our first speaker. Well, that's great. I've seen, yeah. like, I love how you guys went all over California, like not just stayed right. locally and got everybody. And this is right. going to be a great time. Thank you so much for coming yeah, on my show. And, well, thank you for having me. Us. Appreciate it. Yes. And then yeah. hopefully after this is all over, we'll, we'll come back and talk right. about some more and some other stuff right. that you guys love have going to. on. Yeah, that'd be great. Love to. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you so much for coming on my show today. Well, thank you for having me. Okay, so explain the process. You just went through the selection, and we're so happy that you won. Tell us how that was for you. Well, uh, running a campaign is difficult. Brutal. Challenging, <laughs> tiring, and, you know, it's, uh, it seemed like it was like almost like never ending. Um, and I will say that uh, I met a lot of great people out in the community. You know, when I was out campaigning, I got to talk to a lot of people. Most of the people I talked to, like, hey, we're in support of you. You work at the sheriff's office. You know what the sheriff's office needs. So we believe, you know, that you're the best candidate. But I, I actually met a few people who were like, hey, we're going to go with the other guy, you know, and they, they gave me some, some different reasons. And, uh, but it was, a, it was a great experience, and I really think it helped prepare me for the job because of the demands and you're out there and, and you're talking to people and stuff that you say and you know everybody's you're kind of under a microscope and you know much as the way when you're sheriff if you say things you're, you're going to be under a microscope especially today in law enforcement and your experience is so massive <clears throat> I mean this to me seems like this was in the making for a long time because you've done so much for our community can you tell our viewers some of the things that you've done well I started out in 1996. I was a reserve deputy sheriff. I went through the program at Fresno State, which we commonly refer to as the Criminology 108 program. So I worked about a year and a half, and then I went to the police academy, uh, because that training only qualifies you to be a level two reserve. And then I went to the academy to get my training to be a full-time deputy. And then I was hired full-time in November of 98. And I worked my way up through the ranks. I had the opportunity to work courts, boats. I worked in the gang unit in what we refer to as magic. Uh, for about five years and then worked as a sergeant, had the opportunity to work all four uh, patrol areas in the sheriff's office, was a uh, field training sergeant for a few years, was a sergeant in charge of the civil unit, um, ran the Explorer program, and as a lieutenant I ran human resources, internal affairs, which is where we go to investigate other members of our agency, both sworn and non-sworn, and then a captain uh, in charge of the training unit, dispatch, records, uh, and then I uh, was the patrol captain for several years uh, before I came into my current assignment, which right now I'm the assistant sheriff for field services. So I oversee everything in the sheriff's office, like patrol, detectives, admin, except for the jail and the coroner's office that is overseen by another assistant sheriff. Okay. And it seems like you've gotten the ins and outs. Like you've done everything that you could possibly do. <laughs> yes, I, I have. I, I even, as a reserve deputy, I worked in the jail for a period of time, and I did uh, guarding inmates out at the hospital, so I had a little bit of jail experience. Uh, that's one location I wish, as a captain or assistant sheriff, I had the opportunity to work, because you learn a lot about what goes on in the jail. And the jail is very complex. I think a lot of people try to simplify the jail, and they're like, well, you're letting inmates out, <clears throat> or not all the jail beds are full. But there's so much that goes into that sparkle. It's, it, it's incredible because you can't just go, oh, there's an empty bed, I'm gonna put this person in there. There's a whole classification process that we go through. And you have to, you know, it could be anything from what gang you're in or your gang drop, male, female, uh, mental health issues, uh, whether you have you know, a threats on your life because you were in a gang and now you dropped out and now you have to be in a, certain area where you can't be exposed to or have any association with members of any gang because if you were in this gang and you're no longer in it those gang members will come after you and then because you had the rivals from an yeah you know, so it's it's a very complex system you can't just put everyone <clears throat> together that's definitely that well, could be a it's, disaster it's like, it's like we always say you know giants and dodgers you know they're they're different teams in baseball the sheriff uses this analogy you know you can't put Giants and Dodgers fans together, and that's, that's kind of a, a very simplistic view of it. But because if you do and something happens, you're liable. You're going to be responsible. And if somebody comes back later and says, hey, you should have known that John couldn't be in the same cell as, you know, David, then someone's going to hold you at a higher level. You're going to be held accountable anyway, but you're going to be held at a higher level of accountability because they're going to say you were deliberately indifferent. You should have known better but you chose to take that action anyway. That's very true. I, like Your resume is very extensive. I would not want to be in any of those shoes. You had to do so much to get where you are. And I think you're the perfect person for the job. I was kind of wondering who would say why they wouldn't vote for you. 
You know, I think uh, everybody has a, a different perspective on things. Sometimes, you know, as we always say, not everybody's going to like you. Not everybody wants to be your friend. And, right. And then there was those people out there uh, that I ran into that personally knew uh, Mark Salazar, and they were like, well, hey, we sense. like Mark. You know, right. it's nothing personal. We're going to vote for him. And you, you have to understand that, especially if you have a relationship with someone and you know them. Because I had that, too. I had people that were like, hey, we know you. You know, we're going to vote for you. We don't know much about what you do, <laughs> but we just know you. So that, that's just to be expected. I think it's amazing that you want to undertake this role because you, with you've done everything, you should be retiring almost because you've just done so much. Um, and what you're doing is even like just putting more work on yourself. What made you decide that this you had to fill these shoes, especially Margaret Mims? That's a very big role to fill. Well, Sparkle, um, I don't think I'm quite ready to retire just yet. Uh, I'm only 48 years old, so I have. Uh, I think I have a few more years to go. I think I got a little Some bit. Some people retire. I, I know a lot of people have retired around 45 because they put in their time. So. And, and, I, and I started, you know, 23, 22 years old as a reserve. So, I mean, I, I've got the time yeah, in. Yeah, you got the time. You know, it was, it was not a tough decision to make uh, to decide to run for sheriff. Once Sheriff Mims uh, called me in her office and said, hey, I've done this for 16 years, John. I'm, I'm, I'm going to retire. I'm not going to run for re-election. Um, she basically said, hey, I would like you to, uh, to undertake this. But, you know, I know it's a big deal. Just like you said a minute ago, it's a lot of responsibility, you know, and you could look for easier avenues in, in life to pursue. But I uh, just went home. I talked about it with my family. And uh, I thought at my age, and really this is about, you know, it's, my, it's really my turn to give back to the community, to the members of the sheriff's office. And that is, I, I made it to the rank of assistant sheriff and I have this experience, I have this knowledge, I, I know what goes on at the sheriff's office. So really it was like, hey, this is the right time, this is like the right place in life. And you know, if I was ever gonna step up and do it, now is the perfect time. I mean, I have, I'm the right age, I still have you know, a few years to go, a few good years to go. And I have this experience and if I don't do it, I think it would have been more like, you know, it would have been a letdown to, to a lot of people to think, hey, you know what, he got all the way up there, he right. did all this, and then he just, he kind of balked at the chance. So um, I, I felt it was the right thing to do. I, I really felt like during the campaign, when you get kind of tired and, you know, you're like a, another event or you got two events in one night or you're getting up and you're walking those precincts and, you know, handing out flyers, sometimes you get tired, but I always kind of felt this drive, almost like a calling, like, hey, you got to, you know, you, you got to, come on, you can do this, let's go. So I, I always kind of felt like that, I always had something pushing me. Because you worked closely to Sheriff Mims and you saw what, what the job entailed, I mean, what were some of the um, hesitancies in taking it? Well, the hesitancies would be that, you know, you're under a microscope all the time and there is that sacrifice that you're going to have to make to be away from your family. I have a, a wife and three kids. so. You know, there's time that's going to be away from them that I have to devote to my job as sheriff because right. you have to serve all the residents of Fresno County, which is over one million. So there was that thought, but really, after talking over my wife, it was like, you're the assistant sheriff. You know the job. You know what to do. You've got a great person as your mentor, as your role model, right. you know, who can coach you along, which with the election being over in June has been great because we've already been working on the transition. So <clears throat> other than that, no, I mean, it was, it was just the right thing to do at the right time. And do you work closely with our Fresno County Chief of Police? We just had him on a few weeks ago, actually. How do you guys work together? Um, we work well with the uh, Fresno Police Department. We have several units where we're multi-agency. And so we work like in our HIDA unit, which is the drug trafficking. We work with DOJ, we work with the Fresno PD, and we have some members of the sheriff's office in that unit. And then you look at MAGIC, and we have individuals like, you know, MAGIC has Fresno PD, Fresno Sheriff components, and then a lot of other allied agencies are in there. So we work very well together, we cooperate very well together, and when we have like major operations, we'll ask them to come participate with us, and they'll ask us to assist them. So we have a good working relationship, and uh, one thing, we sometimes take for granted here in Fresno is we all work so well together. And you don't realize it, but talking to Chief Balderrama, 
he's complimented on numerous occasions how well law enforcement here in the Central Valley works together. I mean, he's, and he's from Oklahoma City, so he's, you know, he's got a different view from halfway across the country. And when he's making comments like that, you, you know things are working well here in Fresno. Oh, and I, I've noticed that, and that is really true. What are some of the challenges that you're going to face? I know that the no bail um, law that's looked to go into effect on 2023, that that's a big one. How right. do you feel about that? Well, I think that it's a step in the wrong direction. I understand the equity in it that people with money can bail and those without money can't. But the reality is, is that you're allowing individuals who probably wouldn't normally get out of jail to get out and to be able to go out and reoffend. And when you look at the criminal justice system and you look at numbers and you know you could break it down a bunch of different ways, but kind of the standard is 20% of the criminals commit about 80% of the crime. So if you're giving people an easy pass out of jail or we're reducing crimes from felonies to misdemeanors and we're allowing people to not suffer the full or be subject to the full consequence of the law, then they get out and they reoffend, and, and that causes safety issues for the community and it causes our crime rates to go up. So, like I said, not for that, but I can understand why people put it in place because they feel that it, it creates better equity for, for the system. And does this make your job harder? I mean, just like I've seen a lot of crime rise, I mean, we watch. On the news, people are just going into department stores, cleaning up, leaving. It's something that, you know, we can't really, we have not stopped. It's just going on with all this crime. My car was broken into a few months ago um, here in Fresno. Um, crime is becoming so widespread because they're nonviolent, and so they're not getting, you know, extended. And so how does this challenge your job, and what kinds of things are you guys going to do to try to contain this situation? Well, <clears throat> what you've run into is, Years ago, you had a, a law in the books that was called petty theft with priors, and after you were arrested and convicted of petty thefts, then a, a future arrest would become a felony. Well, we've taken that off the books. We've closed prisons down. We've reduced prison population. So now these individuals are just being charged with misdemeanors, and, and they can get right back out on the street. Uh, one way to combat that is to look at the individuals who are your continuous repeat offenders that go into these stores and they steal repetitively, and to look at building a case against them with every time they've committed the crime, and then not just booking them into jail, but working it out so you can get them in front of a judge and have them arraigned on the multitude of crimes that they've committed, and then they'll have a higher bail amount, and then there's a possibility that they would actually stay in jail and they can't go out on the street and commit these crimes. But really what you have to do is focus on those individuals, multiple cases, and get them in front of a judge and get them arraigned and move in that direction. You know, and then the no bail thing is gonna make that harder for their bail amount as well. I, you're facing a lot of things. Right, <laughs> but again, you know, the criminal justice system, you could have a judge say, okay, well, you're such a problem, you're causing all these issues, I, I'm no bail. So that could help hold someone in custody uh, depending on what the, you know, if the judge says your bail's $200,000, well, if there's a no bail system, that's that's not going to matter because no one's going right. to have somebody come up with a monetary amount. But I think what we have to focus on is looking at those individuals that continuously reoffend and really focusing on those individuals that commit violent crimes. And because violent crimes are the ones that jeopardize the safety of our community. When we've got birthday parties where a 12 year old is shot at a birthday party, or just last weekend we had three people shot at a birthday party in the city of Fresno and you see issues of violence like we had years, uh, a few years back out on the west side, out by Mendota with the MS-13 gang that was out there, basically terrorizing a lot of uh, communities between Kerman, uh, San Joaquin, Tranquility, Mendota, and Fireball. We have to really focus because the violent offenders are the ones that end up shooting innocent people or you know, there's a shooting at River Park or there's a shooting at Fashion Fair. We need to focus on those violent offenders because Violence has no place in our community, and really when it impacts innocent people, that's where we should draw the line and we should ensure that individuals who go out there and commit these violent acts stay in jail or go to prison and cannot jeopardize the safety of our community. What's the kind of training that people are undergoing now 
to combat this because with what happened in Uvalde, I mean, I know nothing's settled yet. There's a lot of fingers pointed internally right. at um, you know, the police, the, the sheriff department. So what kinds of things are, you, are gonna be changed here so that we're prepared for a situation like that? Well, <clears throat> Sparkle, it's, it's interesting that you say that because from the time that uh, I was a deputy sheriff back in you know, 2005 to when I made sergeant, we formulated our training at the sheriff's office you know, on an active school shooter. We used to have training almost every year at our skills training, maybe every other year, to go over <clears throat> how to go into a school, what you do if you're dispatched to an active shooter. Well, one of the challenges that we have at the sheriff's office, we, prov we patrol a very large area. So sometimes our backup isn't right around the corner. Sometimes we respond to calls, maybe by ourselves. Well, what we focused on, and what we still focus on in our school safety training or active shooter training is, that if you get to campus or to a school and you hear shots being fired and you know there's an active shooter, you're not waiting for your backup. You know, we have, we give our deputies a handgun, a patrol rifle, and a shotgun. You are going in and you are going to engage that active shooter. Because the children at school and the teachers and the staff don't have the equipment, <clears throat> they don't have the training, that's your job. And you have the ability to take that person out and make sure they can't harm anyone else on that campus. So that is your mission. Um, you're not gonna wait for backup. You're gonna go in, you're gonna engage them. You know, best case scenario when you start going after them and if you have to shoot at them, hopefully that uh, they'll turn and go somewhere else. And at the very least, they're not going to be focusing their attention on defenseless children and defenseless you're teachers. At least going to be a decoy. <clears throat> right. Right. It's no. like a distraction. So, so that's how we train. That's what we expect. And, you know, through and throughout law enforcement, a lot of us have kids. I mean, I have 16, 13, and 10. So if my kids are on campus and something at a school and something bad like that's happening, my expectation is that the law enforcement officers or officer that arrives is going to do everything they can to help protect my child. Do you think we're ever going to get to a point where we are going to arm somebody at the school at some point to prepare for their other teachers? I know it's like a big... It, it is. It's a, it's a controversial issue, but I believe that, yes, we will. I think that, you know, if we can't have a police officer on campus all the time, you know, we have a lot of individuals in Fresno County that have qualified and are law-abiding, responsible gun owners. They have CCWs. Um, it is a double-edged sword, you know, somebody brings a gun onto campus that's a teacher or a staff member who's been trained. You know, that's a hard pill for some people to swallow because they're not comfortable with guns, but it, it would be an extra layer of protection. And if someone's trained properly, they have the ability to protect themselves, protect the children, and protect other teachers. And if you think about it from a little bit you know, higher level, if I was going to go to school and, and start shooting on campus, but I knew that teachers and administrators carried guns, some people might think twice about right. doing that. It might be a deterrent. Just like <clears throat> if you were going up to a school and you see a police car there and you see a uniformed police officer, you're probably going to think twice about going onto that campus and doing something. Um, just like you see now, talking about the retail theft. I mean, some stores have hired contract police officers with the patrol car in the uniform because it deters crime. I mean, there is a deterrent effect to it. I think it makes people feel safe. And really, I think we owe that to, to the children because they're our future to make sure that they have a safe environment that they can go to school, they can learn without the fear of something like this occurring. Because when we went to school, I'm 48, we, we, that was never a thought that crossed our mind. It's you never, you never thought about that, you know? You thought about maybe there's going to be a fist fight at recess. Right, and, exactly. Or after school there's going to be a fight or something. But you never... That was your, never a real fear, yeah. Yeah, when I was in fifth and sixth grade, you never thought, hey, someone's going to come onto campus and just randomly start shooting at students and faculty. Speaking of firearms, um, recently every registered gun owner in California, their information was leaked <laughs> to their address, social yes. security numbers. What can be done about that? What, what are you guys talking about there? 
Well, there's there's a couple different things going on there. The Cal State Sheriff's Association is is looking into it about kind of how this occurred, you know, why it occurred, you know, was it some sort of misstep or, you know, uh, mistake by somebody at DOJ? Was it a, a glitch in the system? Right now, I, we're in the process of getting the names of the individuals whose information was released, and we're going to figure out who got their information released, and then we're going to get the the contact info for them because we have it. A lot of it's in our database because there are CCW holders. And then uh, there'll be some notifications made as far as like, hey, your information was released. But in a way, it's really scary because now, as it's been said, someone will look and say, hey, they know where everybody is that has guns. I mean. And maybe those that don't have are going to be more vulnerable now. Right, but if you're a, if you were a criminal looking for guns, now, now you, you know can go target them. where they are and who has them. There's multiple layers of why this is really scary. <clears throat> yeah. And then, unfortunately, you know, gun owners that went through all the legalities didn't get an illegal firearm. They went through all the legalities. Now their social security numbers are out there, and that's also a big concern. Oh, absolutely. You have identity theft and a whole lot of other issues that can come from that. I mean, look at what happened with EDD uh, a few years back with everybody from even in prison right. committing fraud to get unemployment. I mean, it, it's a real fear. And when somebody steals your bank account information or your personal information and it ruins your credit or they get benefits on your behalf and then somebody finds out that, hey, you're not supposed to have those benefits. Yeah, it's, it's scary and it's, uh, it, it's a reality. These are, these are all very challenging <clears throat> questions. You're doing great answering them. And again, to bring up why you would even want this role with like just so much going on, what's the legacy you hope to leave that when you leave this seat, you're like, oh, these are the changes that he made. What are some of the things that you hope to accomplish? Well, first and foremost, to leave the sheriff's office better than when I took over, to make sure that we're always improving, whether it was you know Sheriff Mims taking over for Sheriff Pierce, and the improvements that she made in the last 16 years. And then however long I, I'm sheriff, to, to make improvements, to make the sheriff's office better, uh, to make sure that the community knows like sheriff's office is continually improving. Because what we do is we provide service. And you always want people to, to, to leave thinking, hey, they've improved the quality of their service. So that's, that's number one. Uh, to make sure that I'm a strong advocate for the men and women that work in the sheriff's office. Um, to make sure that I, I listen and I'm attentive to their needs and to make sure they get what they need to do their job, whether it's, it's enough pay and benefits so we can recruit and retain good people to provide good service, or whether it's you know, mental health or whether it's you know, a gym for them to work out in, or hey, there's no parking downtown and our correctional officers struggle with parking, especially during the day. Let's find places for them to park where they don't have to pay for parking, uh, even if, like right now, we've come up with some transport vans and we're, we're getting correctional officers off-site at a good, safe location to park, and then we're getting them over to the jail. Um, you know, and just really recruiting and retaining good employees. That is one of my first and foremost goals because if you keep good people, then you're not having to constantly churn over the hiring process. And we've struggled with that lately with the correctional officers. We've got quite a few vacancies, about 90 vacancies right now. Wow. Out of 500 and 500 or so positions. So really, that's something that I also want to fix. And um, I th think we're on the path to do it, but it's not something that happens quickly and it doesn't happen overnight. But right now, the amount of overtime that the correctional officers work is, it's, it's a lot. And uh, I, my hat's off to them. They work really hard and they're pushing 16 hour days, sometimes three and four days a week. And I know that takes them away from their families. I know they basically go home, they sleep and they come back to work. But hopefully in the future with some new hires, we can reduce that overtime and help improve their quality of life. And really right now is hopefully keep people working at the sheriff's office because it is no fun to be the HR staff and to constantly be rolling people through. Uh, you know, it feels like, you know, you're kind of running on the treadmill and you're not going anywhere right. because I hired will. five and six left. So, and then I talked to the HR staff within the sheriff's office. I talked to them daily and 
you know, that's how some of them feel. So we're going to really do our best to fix that problem, and, and I think you're going to see some progress here shortly. And what are some of the things we as a community can do to help mm -hmm. you? Because I, I know you have all these challenges, and like I said, I mean, you mm -hmm. might not be on board with some of these laws that are going to take place, and you have no choice but to follow what goes on, and then if there is more crime because some of these laws are taken back, it all falls on you, falls on you guys, and so I know you have a big undertaking. What are some of the ways that we, just me as a citizen, can help you guys out? Well, I think first and foremost, one thing that I see uh, or I've heard when I'm out in the community is there's nothing better when you're at a restaurant or you're out somewhere and you're in uniform and somebody comes up to you and says, hey, thank you for the work that you do. I really appreciate what you do. I, I think that goes a long way because in law enforcement, we respond to different calls. We do things. We put our lives on the line. We put ourselves in danger for people that we don't know, people that we've right. never met. So when somebody you don't know or you've never met just walks up to you and says thank you, th that means a lot and it goes a long way because it reaffirms that, hey, what you're doing has meaning and it has purpose and there are, regardless of what you hear in the media or what you hear here and there, there are a lot of good people out there who really appreciate and respect what you do. Well, I appreciate what you do and I appreciate you so much for coming on my show today. One more thing is uh, the message to everyone out there is what you can do for law enforcement is Make sure that you have a strong voice and make sure that you vote. Vote for individuals at whatever level it is, whether it's county government, city government, state assembly, or nationally. Personally, vote for people that support law and order and want to make our community safe and are doing the best to make communities safe and not giving us excuses and reasons why certain laws can't be enforced or can't be passed. Because at the end of the day, the safety of all of us is what's important. Regardless of where you live in the 6,000 square miles of Fresno County, the state of California, or the United States, if we don't feel safe, we're not going to go out and recreate. We're not going to feel safe going to work. We're not going to feel safe leaving our houses. I really think that that's something that we need to look at with our elected officials. And they need to make progress to make our community safer and not just talk about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate you having me on. Felt right in the morning, felt right in the summertime, it felt right drinking cherry wine with you. Just wanted to own it, just wanted to take the time, learn all the things that I could about you. Now it's such a mess here, oh, we are distressed here. You to be so easy with you Now I must confess here Oh, I must confess dear Don't think I'm in love with you Winter is coming And I don't know what to do And there's no more use in running No more running to you And I don't want your loving I don't want to be just friends Knowing all this time Playing pretend Playing pretend Playing pretend Ooh, Playing pretend It's a mystery.